know, we're about to enter the Christmas season, the holiday season, whatever season you want to call it. But for me, it's the Jesus season. And so we say Jesus, and we have all kind of titles for Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the, the Savior. We, we, but what does that mean? Who is Jesus? Do you know that Jesus is probably the most controversial figure in human history? Do you know that the Bible is the most studied, the most analyzed, and the most controversial book on the planet Earth? In our greatest universities, we have the greatest university scholars. They're still analyzing and dissecting this book, trying to disprove it, not prove it. But can I tell you that all scholars have come into agreement that it's probably the most historically accurate book on the planet Earth? So then all the billions, see, we could take those billions of dollars that they're using to study the scriptures and try to disprove it, and we could use that to help people. <laughs> If they only would read and understand what it is they're studying. And after all of their intellectual insight and wisdom is done with, they still can't disprove the book. It's still the best-selling book in the world. And the Bible has, oh, for centuries, transformed millions of human lives. It's transformed whole civilizations. And the book is centered around one person. His name is Jesus. His name is Yahshua. Yahshua is his Hebrew name, and it means God's salvation. God's salvation. Everything in Scripture points to him. The Old Testament, the New Testament, and even that blank piece of paper in between. Yeah, because he wiped your slate clean. Come on. So today I want to walk through some of these scriptures. I'm going to speak to your head for a minute and then we're going to talk to your heart. Because you can't understand Jesus with your head. You have to understand him with your heart. You see, they do all these studies. Professors teach whole courses on New Testament and Old Testament and all of these things. But one thing they can't figure out is why was there a group of men who walked and lived with Jesus and were willing to die because they believed who he was? See, there's no doctrine for that. There's no intellectual assent for that. Something happened inside of those men's hearts that changed them, transformed them, and they were willing to be tortured and die for what they believed about Jesus. What is it that they believed about Jesus? I challenge you today that they believe Jesus was God. That they believe God came as a man. That in the beginning, God created male and female. He created Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve had free will. They had a choice. And they chose to partake of some fruit. And that they fell, and they fell into what we call sin. And that Adam began to pass sin along his genes to his children, and the earth became filled with sin. Sin is known as the curse. And that God had a plan of redemption from the beginning of time, as it says in Ephesians, that before the foundations of the world, you were predestined for adoption in him. But predestined doesn't take away your ability to choose. Are y'all with me this morning? What is it about Jesus that when we mention his name, people get in an uproar? Why do they want to pull him off of signs and take him out of schools? What, what is it about him that makes him so different from all the other prophets and all the other teachers? They say he was a real man. All scholars now agree that Jesus existed. That Jesus of Nazareth, the man, was real. He lived a real life. They've agreed that he was a person that walked the earth, but they still don't agree about who he was. He's the most controversial person, as I said before. He's the most revered man on planet Earth, but he's also the most reviled man on planet Earth. Why is this? Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, New Age mysticism, they all agree that Jesus was a good man. They all agree that Jesus was a prophet. They all agree that Jesus was sent by God. So all the religions of the world say, yes, Jesus is significant. What makes us different? They deny his deity. In order to become a Muslim, you have to say that, that God is not begotten, nor has he begotten. That means that you deny there is a son of God. In order to become a Satanist, anybody know what that means? People that worship Satan. Do you know you have to renounce Jesus 
Christ. Why do you renounce him? Today I want us to look at Jesus, and I believe that the thing that separates Jesus from everybody else is he demands a decision. He demands a decision. He demands that man make a choice because it's in Jesus' righteousness, in Jesus' purity, in Jesus' holiness, in Jesus' word that we have to be confronted with ourselves. That we have to come to a place where we have to look at our own hearts. We have to look at our own desires. There's no way out except to believe that he is who he said he is. And then to put our faith in him. And when we put our faith in him, as, as Cleve said, we have to go all in The question today is, is Jesus God? As we celebrate Christmas, and I won't get into the ins and outs of that, I celebrate giving because I celebrate a gift. Whether Jesus was born in the spring, born in the summer, or born in the fall, I celebrate him every day. So a holiday doesn't determine the amount of praise, the amount of sacrifice, the amount of worship that I give my king because I know him. And see, Jesus doesn't want you to know about him. He wants you to know him. But in order to know him, you have to be willing to go to places where nobody else can take you. See, when you know him, something changes. When you know him, something happens on the inside. When you get a revelation of who he is, it begins to transform your heart. And I've told you before, and I'll say it again, everything that we see going on in the world, all the wars, all the famines, all the poverty, all the murders, all the crimes, all the division, all the hatred, it's a product of the human heart. It's the human heart that has to be changed. No other religion in the world promises you that. You can't pray your way to it. You can't fast your way to it. You can't give your way to it. you got to give yourself up to it. They killed Jesus, historically proven that Jesus was crucified. Historians have documented it through Roman history and through Jewish history. The first century historian Josephus, if you don't know him, write his name down. Look him up. Study some of his writings. Jesus was crucified. Why did they kill Jesus? There were three charges against this man, Jesus. The first charge was that he loved and lived with sinners. As a teacher, as a rabbi, as a religious man, it was against the law for him to eat and dine with sinners. That was a charge that was brought against him. This man loves sinners. He can't be of God. Second charge. He healed on the Sabbath. How many of you, if your mother or your child is sick and it's Sunday morning, you're going to lay hands on them anyway? I saw one person raise their hand. That's, I don't know. I guess I need to fill out my crowd a little more. Realize. He healed on the Sabbath. And so they accused him of breaking the law because a man was in need, a person was in need, and he, he thought that their healing was greater than recognizing a day of the week. And this is the last one that everybody gets upset about that's created wars for centuries. This is the reason that people overseas, our brothers and sisters right now, are being beheaded, being tortured, being burned alive. Come on. I know the children are in here today, but we need to prepare them for, for, for who they're going to be in the future. He claimed to be the son of the living God. He claimed it outright. And it infuriated people. So who is Jesus? What is it that we're about to celebrate in the month of December? I'm challenging you today that we're celebrating the gift of God to save mankind. Was he just a baby in a manger? Was he even born in a manger? See, he was born to die. Inside of Jesus was everything that mankind needed. Everything that God intended for man. Your deliverance was locked up in that fleshly body. Your freedom was locked up in that fleshly body. Your salvation was locked up in that fleshly body. Your will to overcome was locked up in that fleshly body. Your healing was locked up in that fleshly body. 
Your access to God was locked up in that flesh and he had to be whipped. He had to be broken. His skin had to be tore open. And when his blood began to run, out came your freedom. Out came your deliverance. Out came you. See, that's why people get upset. Because man believes he is God. We live in a world of secularism and humanism and narcissism. It's the same thing that happened in Genesis chapter 3 when the devil said, did God really say? Don't you know you can be like him? And we love our buildings. We love our cities. We love our accomplishments. We love to believe that we're the masters of our own destiny, that we're the creators of our own creations, that we can choose, and you can choose, but in the end, there's a, there's a consequence. What did Jesus say about who he was? John 8, 58 and 59, look at what Jesus said. Now, he's talking to a group of religious men. He's talking to people that know the Scriptures. He's talking to men that have studied the scriptures their whole life. They've devoted themselves to being scholars of his word, kind of like our intellectuals of today, who devoted themselves to Hebrew and Greek language. They've devoted themselves to New Testament studies. They devoted themselves to analytical surveys of the Bible. And this is how these men were. And they were looking at, the, they were looking at Jesus, and Jesus was healing on the Sabbath. He was living and loving the sinners. He was claiming to be the son of God and they stood and they challenged him. If you read up in this passage of scripture, you'll see the whole conversation. And they told him, you're demon possessed. Because you hang around those sinners. How many of you know that you're a sinner? That we were all a sinner. You might have been a million dollar sinner or you might have been a two dollar sinner. But we were all sinners. Now in Christ, in Christ, I'm washed I'm cleansed. I become a child of God. What happened to those 12 men that you saw being commissioned? Somewhere along the way, they made a decision to become a child of God. They were babes in Christ. Then they made a decision to allow people to begin to disciple them so they became adolescent sons of God. And now they're beginning to take responsibility not only for their salvation, but for the salvation of others so they're becoming men of God. It's a process of maturity. It's a process of what Jesus does in our life. He takes us from one phase of life and leads us into another phase of life. Is everybody with me this morning? He was challenged by these religious leaders. And he told them this. He said, Abraham waited for the day that I would come. Abraham is a patriarch of the Jewish faith. Abraham was their, their model, their example, their leader. They, they, they almost worshipped him. And they said, you're not even 50 years old, and you're telling me that you know Abraham? He waited for your day? And this is what Jesus said. John 8, 58 and 59. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am in that one statement, Jesus didn't just claim to be the Son of God, but He claimed to be God, and He claimed to be eternal. The Word of God says that in the beginning, God spoke and said, let there be light. And when God spoke, His Word came and began to shine the glory of God all around the universe. How was there light before there was sun, moon, and stars? You tell me that. Because there was light before he ever created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Read it in Genesis chapter number 1. He spoke, the word was there, and the word began to shine. The word began to illuminate. The word illuminates the purpose of God in your life. His word illuminates who he is to you. His word will illuminate your heart and change your being, and you'll become more like Christ every day. I think I'm preaching today. I'm supposed to... I'm having fun. I'm like the Georgia quarterback. When you know what you're made to do, you just do it. Come on, somebody. He told them before Abraham was, I am. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So you've got to understand he was telling them I am eternal and I am God. Now, if you study language as the scholars do, you'll understand that when he said I am in his, in his dialect of Aramaic, which is a form of Hebrew, he said Yah. Yah. 
Before Abraham, Yah. Before you, Yah. Yah is the name of God that was spoken to Moses in the book of Exodus when God called him. He said, Yahweh, I am that I am. I will be that I will be. Or as we say in Alabama, I is who I is. <laughs> and so these scholars, these Pharisees and these scribes, when Jesus said that, the Bible says they tore their clothes. It says in 59, and they picked up stones because he had just committed what they consider blasphemy by speaking the unspeakable name of God. He stood before them and he said, Yah. I am divine. I am eternal. I am the Messiah. 365 prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus. He fulfilled every one of them from the time he was born to where he was born to how he was born to how he lived to how he preached to what he did to when he died and when he rose. Jesus is the only man that's ever walked the planet earth that fulfilled all 365 messianic prophecies. He is. He is. This is what he said of his name. He said, my name will divide households. There's something about the name of Jesus that's different than the name of any other prophet. Would you agree with that this morning? Maybe you're in here today and you don't know the word. Maybe you're, maybe you're not saved. Maybe you came seeking and wanting to understand more about God. And maybe you're not familiar with scripture. I just want to walk with you real quick through some scripture as we have a little more time to just show you Jesus throughout the Bible. I'm going to start with Jesus' words, and then we're going to get into some heart things. How many of you like some heart things? Because God deals with your heart before he deals with your head. Things begin to happen in the heart. The Bible says we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. But first, something must happen in my heart. I get a revelation of my need for God. That's where Jesus comes in. When I recognize who I am, when I recognize that money, fame, fortune, Career, success, all of that's good, but it will never fulfill me. Relationships, children, vacations, traveling the world, it'll never fulfill me. There's something in me that cries out for more. There's something in me that longs for relationship with something greater than myself. Ecclesiastes 3, the wisest man in the Bible until Jesus said that God put eternity in the hearts of man, that every person sitting in this room, you've got a place in you that only God can fill. You've got a place in you that's reserved from him. You've got a place in you that nobody else can fill but God. I challenge you today to let that place begin to be stirred up. It says he put eternity in the hearts of men, but that he made it so you couldn't figure things out without him. And what Jesus did when Jesus came, Yahshua, God's salvation, he became flesh so he could be tore open so that his blood could cleanse the sins of man. And now man can have access to God. You can be filled with God's spirit. The spirit is what changes us. The spirit is what transforms us. The spirit is what makes us new. You should be getting excited right now. Not hollering and getting emotional, but you should be getting stirred. Sometimes it's good to remember what God has done for us. The word is constantly saying, remember me. Remember the Lord thy God. Remember what I've done for you. When the children of Israel came out of the wilderness and they crossed over into the promised land, God sent them back into the water. He said, go and get 12 stones and I want you to set them along the banks so that when the children for generations to come, when they look at these stones, they'll say, what happened right there? And you can begin to tell them the testimony of what I did for you. How I brought you out of slavery. How I delivered you from drugs. How I repaired your marriage after adultery. How I brought your wayward kids back home. Come on, how when you were laying on your deathbed, when you were contemplating suicide, when you lost all your money, when you went bankruptcy, when everything wasn't going your way, you remember what I've done. You remember what I've brought you through. You remember where I've brought you from. We have to build memorials in our life. We have to build places to where when everything lets us down and everybody lets us down and we don't know what we're going to do, we can go back to that place. See, I believe I'm a little bit different. It may be because I'm from Alabama. I'm not, I haven't figured it out yet. But I believe that he put those stones there because he knew there was a battle waiting for them. There was a city that they was going to have to take and there were some giants that they were going to have to fight. 
And I believe that he knew that they were going to be afraid that circumstances were going to challenge their belief in him. That the giants were going to be bigger than what he had done in their life. And I believe that he put those stones there so that when they were trying to run back over into the wilderness, they would remember, God brought me out. God delivered me. I can't go back. There's no going back for me. I remember the night that Jesus touched me. I remember what my life had become trying to live it on my own. I remember years of addiction. I remember brokenness. And I, you know, this is my testimony. This is my rock. And you've got a rock. And I share these stories with you so that you can understand no matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, and no matter where you've been, that God doesn't change. He's always the same. And that he's no respecter of persons. I remember the night when when I cried out from a broken heart. There wasn't a preacher and there wasn't a choir. There wasn't a church. There wasn't any lights. I was was staying in a hotel room that cost $27 a night. I'd been strung out on drugs for over 20 years and I had gotten clean for a year. And I had gotten a job and I began to piece my life together. And I relapsed. And at that moment, I gave up. I said, I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of trying. I've tried all their programs. I've tried the steps. I've tried the penitentiaries. I've tried the jailhouses. I've tried everything that I know, and I'm at the end of myself. Has anybody ever been there? About five people. Because I'm telling you that if you had, you might, it might not be drugs. It doesn't have to be drugs. It it, it can be the fact that you've got 20 degrees and you're working in your career, but you're never filled. Every time you get something, you want something more. It might be the fact that you've been married for 20 years. It might be the fact that you've been in church for 20 years and you're just showing up. There's nothing alive. There's nothing going on. Because I remember that night I was dead. I was so dead I had enough drugs to try to kill myself. That was my plan. I wasn't going to walk out of that room. And somewhere in the middle of the night, I began to go to war with God. Because I'd heard about him. People had told me about him. I'd seen preachers preach about him. I'd watched people roll on the floor. I'd seen all kind of tambourines and stuff going on, but I had never experienced him. I had been broken emotionally, but my will had never been broken. See, I had come to an altar in an emotional experience, and I had said, I need Jesus to get me out of this circumstance, but I'm not willing to give up the things I do. You see, Jesus demands a decision. Why is he the most hated man in the world, but also the most loved? Because he demands a decision. He demands that man come face to face with himself. He's the only prophet, the only teacher, the only one who said, I am God, and you have to make a decision. Uh, We don't hear this no more. We don't preach from the Bible no more. We preach a night at the movies. We, We get our principles and patterns from movies now instead of from the word of God. And we try to integrate that into this encounter and this experience that you must have in order to be saved. It's different for every one of us. All of our brokenness is different. All of our brokenness looks different. We all come from different places. We're all on journeys. Your experience doesn't have to be like mine. I needed that because I was just a fool. Somebody got that. Somebody didn't. I was a fool. I was hard-headed. I was ignorant. I got off my notes for a minute. But somebody needs to hear this today. You need to understand that no matter where you're at, no matter what your despair is, no matter, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what the world has said, no matter what the company said, no matter what the doctor said, no matter what the school said about your child, no matter what your child told you on the phone last night about, they'll never come back to your house. You need to know that God can do all things. That's what separates Jesus. I can't discipline myself into freedom. No matter how many times a day I go and pray, when I'm praying to something that's not real, it can't change me. Because ultimately what Jesus does and what the Word of God does is it gives man a reflection of himself. 
And ultimately, when you make a decision for Christ, the reason that we fall in love with him is because we realize that without him, we can't do anything. The reason that we fall in love with Jesus is because when we make a decision for him and he gives me God's spirit, which is the purpose that he died, that spirit begins to show me how far away from God I am. But then that spirit begins to comfort me, letting me know that you can be close to him again. And he begins to change my desires. He begins to change my beliefs. He begins to change my thought patterns. He begins to change who I am. As it says in the book of Corinthians 5.17 that, old things are gone behold that means hold up wait a minute let me put some Jesus in it behold therefore all stop time out all things become new I feel a touchdown coming on He said, he told the Pharisees again, he said, you search the scriptures, John 5, 39. You search the, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. Yeah, you, you think all the good works, all the things that you do, you think eternal life is in that. How many of you know that's what paganism believes? That's what, 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 what the world, what world religions believe. There's no security in their salvation. They believe that my good works have to outweigh my bad works, and I hope that I get in. <laughs> well, let me give you some good news today. The reason why every one of you need to be up the, at this altar while we're done today. Even if you believe in Jesus in their eyes, you're still going to be okay. Y'all didn't hear me. The good news is that when you give your all to Jesus, even in their religions, you're going to be okay. But if you don't give your all to Jesus, according to his religion, you're not going to be okay. So I choose to be all in with Jesus. So they believe that your good works have to outweigh your bad works. But Jesus said, no, it's your faith in me. You think that your ability to comprehend scripture, your ability to understand the word, your ability to do good things gives you eternal life. He said, no, I am eternal life. When he called a dead man from a tomb, how many of you believe you've been dead? See, I know that Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. That's in the book of Ephesians. That's in the book of Colossians. That's in the gospel of John. I'm throwing them out there so you can go home and look them up. That's the gospel. We were dead. We were dead to God. It's like when your child does you wrong and you say, man, it's like you're dead to me. I don't even know you anymore. I can't have any intimacy with you anymore. We were dead to God. But the Bible says in Ephesians, but God, time out. Hold up. Wait a minute. Let me put some Jesus in it. But God, but wait, but God, who was rich in mercy. Rich in mercy. Made us alive through Christ. That's the good news of the gospel. So he told these men, he said, you think those scriptures, you, you look for them, but you don't even see me. If you knew God, you would know who I am. Luke 24, 27, listen to what he says. He, he's walking down the road. He's died. He's resurrected from the dead. He's come out of the grave. How many of you know in order to be a Christian, you, you have to believe that? Let me just help you. They can't disprove it. They can't disprove it. They've spent a lot of money trying to disprove it. They can't disprove it. So you're not crazy. You're actually saved when you believe that. He comes out of the grave. Two of his disciples are walking down the road. He comes up behind them, and he begins to tell them. It says in Luke 24, 27, that beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures and the things concerning himself. Why am I telling you this? Because we're talking about Jesus. And during the month of December, we're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to talk about who he was. We're going to talk about who he is, and we're going to talk about who he's going to be. And you need to know that everything in the Bible, everything that we believe is centered around him. The Bible calls it preeminence, preeminence. He's exalted above everything. He is everything. In him is everything. So let's look through some of the scriptures and let's see where we find Jesus. Jesus was in creation. I said it earlier. God spoke and said, let there be light. When he said that, Jesus began to shine 
and God's work began. He was the seed of the woman in Genesis chapter 3. The, the curse was coming and God said that your seed will crush his seed. He spoke to a woman. I don't know if we have any biologists in the house or maybe some doctors in the house. But I think that we can all agree that women do not have seed. If you didn't know that, I'm educating you today. Men carry seed. So this is a prophecy that there's going to be one that is born without a male. How many of you know that we believe in the virgin birth? That Jesus is the only man on earth that fulfilled that prophecy. And then he didn't just say the seed of the woman, but he said that he will crush the head of the serpent. That's the cross in the book of Genesis. Jesus was in the garden. When Adam was naked, scared, and afraid after he had sinned, he became vulnerable. How many of you know that sin always keeps us in guilt and shame? That when we live in sin, we can't be in God's presence. That the antidote for sin is Jesus. The antidote, see, you, people don't go to hell because they're bad people. They go to hell because they reject the antidote. People aren't going to make it because they say, no, I don't want Jesus. See, he demands a decision. He demands a decision. The Gospel of John says he didn't come to condemn the world. He didn't come to judge the world. He came that through him the world might be saved. So when young men tell me only God can judge me, I say, no, you judge yourself when you don't accept Jesus. You place yourself in judgment. Because you refuse to accept what God is offering, the peace offering, the sacrifice of the life of Jesus. Does that make sense? That's what the word reconciliation means, to be made peaceful, to bring two enemies together, to reconcile. Now, the word says that God was inside of Jesus reconciling the world to himself. That he was tempted at all points as man, but yet without sin. Do you understand? So, so we're not messed up because we're bad. We're messed up because we're born that way. See, when people come to you and they say, but I was born this way, don't argue with them because the truth is they were born that way. I was born a way. I was born predisposition to addiction predispositioned, predispositioned. That means not positioned. My position was messed up. I was born with inferior genetics, according to science. Y'all don't know about that? I was a product of a crazy man, but I'm going to honor him today. I led him to the Lord. He got saved, praise Jesus. What am I so, so I was a product of my father's DNA. What did Jesus do? Who is Jesus? Jesus has repositioned me. I was born this way, so I must be born again. One must be born from above. What, what did Jesus do? Who is Jesus? He gave me the choice, the power, the ability to be born from above. When born from above, I'm no longer a product of Larry Eugene Sanders. I become a product of Yahshua, Jesus, God's salvation. So all of the things that predispositioned me, all of the attributes that made me who I used to be, all of the personality traits that made me do the crazy things that I did, all of that craziness, that selfishness, all of those things that drove my life to where it was no longer had authority over me. In Christ, I have authority over them. Is that kind of, y'all, y'all get, that's what it means to be born again. Do you understand? We say that a lot, but I don't think we explain it. To be born again means that I'm no longer a product of the sin nature. I'm a product of God's grace. I'm a product of the cross. That's what happened in Genesis in the garden. God committed the first sacrifice. The Bible says that Adam was naked and afraid. That represents vulnerability and weakness. He was afraid of God. He couldn't stand up and do what God asked him to do. So God killed an animal and made some skins to cover him. That's prophetic of Jesus. Because God killed Jesus and covered us with his righteousness. Y'all didn't get excited about that. I got excited when I read that. That that's who I was, but that's not who I have to be anymore. 
he covers us with the righteousness of Christ. He was in the story of Abel. Jesus is the brother that gave his best. He's the brother that worshiped from a pure heart. He's the brother that was obedient unto death. Abel brought a sacrifice being obedient to God and he was killed because of the envy of his other brother. When Jesus stood before the Pharisees, they were his brothers. They were part of his Jewish nation and he said, Yah, they killed him because they were jealous. They were envious because God's righteousness always shows me my inability to be righteous. But Jesus is the hope of the world, meaning that in Christ I can be righteous. The word says that he who knew no sin became sin, that we may become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Abel's death was a product of his father's sin. Jesus' death was a product of our father's sins and our own sins. He died so that we no longer have to suffer for the sins of our father. Are you with me today? He's throughout the Old Testament. He was Noah's ark because he's the preserver of life. He's a fresh start. He's a new beginning. He's our protection from the flood that comes our way. He's Abraham's promise. He was Isaac on the altar, plus he's the ram in the bush. He rushed up Jacob at Peniel. He was symbolized in the life of Joseph. He was betrayed by his brothers sold as a slave, falsely accused, and became a captive to the prison of death. But then he was released to be the governor in charge, the magistrate of the kingdom, so he could set the whole family free. He spoke to Moses as a burning bush, and then he hid him in the cleft of a rock. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Does anybody familiar with the Passover? Jesus is the Passover lamb. The cross is the doorpost. When we get under the cross, when we come and bow down at the cross and we're covered under the blood, the angel of death has to pass us over. We receive eternal life and communion with God the Father. Jesus is the manna in the desert, the bread of life. He's the rock that Moses hit that now flows the living water. He was the tabernacle in the wilderness, the way the truth, and the life. Jesus is the Ark of the Covenant connecting man to God. He's a type of Joshua who shares his name, Yahshua, which means God's salvation. He's the Lord of hosts, commander-in-chief, leading us into our promise. He spoke to Gideon in the wine press and turned his fear into valor. He was Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, buying us back from slavery and exile from God. He was Job, faithful in his suffering and enduring to the end. He was sung about in Psalms. He's the wisdom of Proverbs. He's the eternity of Ecclesiastes. He's the lover king in the Song of Solomon. All the prophets long for his coming. They prophesied of his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. He is the law. Every jot and every tittle has been fulfilled. He is Jesus. He is Yahshua. He is God. He's the last Adam, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 45. He's our advocate, according to 1 John 1, 21. He's the Almighty, according to Revelation 2, 8. He is the visible image of the invisible God, according to Colossians 1, 15. He is the Word that became flesh. He's the vine, we are the branches. He's the light of the world, shining into darkness, illuminating the hearts of men. He's the son of righteousness, the son of man, the son of David, and the son of God. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's our great high priest. He's the sacrificial lamb. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the chief shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's the shepherd of our soul. He's the great physician. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the everlasting father. He's the almighty God. He's the king of saints in Revelation 15.3. He's the king of saints in Revelation 15.3. He's the king of ages in 1 Timothy 1.17. He's the king of kings in 1 Timothy 6.15. And he's simply the king in Zechariah 9.9. 9. 
In him the fullness of God dwelled, according to Colossians 2.9. He nailed the ordinances to the cross, made a public spectacle of all principalities and powers. What's that mean in unreligious terms? He beat the devil in the head. He crushed the head of Satan. He bought your freedom. He bought you back. He came to deliver you and to set you free. We were blind. He made us see. We were lost. He lit our path. We were dead. He gave us life. He is Emmanuel, God in us. He is Christ, the anointed one. He is Jesus, the Savior of the world. He is the great I Am. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's the all in all. He's the greatest gift. In Him we live, we breathe, we have our being. He came that we would not be condemned, but that through Him the world would be saved, that we could be forgiven, we could be set free, we could be healed, we could be delivered, we could be whole, we could be complete. Give him praise. Give him praise. See, when you know him, something happens on the inside. When you know him, it becomes more than words. When you know him, it becomes more than a service. When you know him, it becomes real. You can't help but love him. To know him is to love him. To know him is to serve him. To know him is to need him. To know him is to want him. To know him is to tell the whole world who he is. Now you know I love you, right? You know I love you. You're my family. But if we can stand up for him like that in here, then we need to stand up for him like that out there. It shouldn't take a short, fired up preacher from Alabama to make you scream for him. Come on. You should be excited about what God's done for you. And the world needs to know it says that we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, that I've got stones laying along the bank of the river, and every time I feel like going back, I'm going to remember where God brought me from. And I'm going to let the world know. Let me tell you what Jesus said, and we're going to come to a close. Where you at, George? He stood up in the temple with the word, and this is what he said. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. To preach good tidings to the poor. Are you poor today? I'm not talking about money. You might have a lot of money in your bank account, a lot of stocks, a lot of bond, bonds, a big house, a nice job, a great career, but you're poor in your spirit. You know that you're empty. You know that your life is vanity, that you've looked and you've searched and you've accomplished and you've done amazing things. And I'm telling you that God is calling you this morning. He wants to make you wealthy in the spirit, rich in the spirit. He says, I come to preach the gospel, the good news of salvation, redemption, reconciliation, communion with God, purpose, missional minded. Come on. I come to preach that to the poor, to those who have found that the world is empty. It holds nothing for you. The wells are dry. He goes on and he says, He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Maybe you're brokenhearted today. Maybe you're disappointed. Maybe life has thrown you some left hooks and some uppercuts and... You've got a few interceptions on your record in this game of life that we're dealing with. I'm here to tell you, he came to mend the brokenhearted. If you look up the word broken in this passage, it literally means shattered. That pieces of your life have been left everywhere that you've went. You lost a little bit of hope here. You lost a little bit of faith there. You lost belief in people here. That every time disappointment and discouragement has came, you left a piece of yourself there. You spent your whole life trying to give your life to something worthy. And I'm telling you that God is telling you today, I'm that thing. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. He said, I came to proclaim liberty to the captives. What's holding you captive today? A lot of times when we think about bondage and captivity, we think about drugs and alcohol. But what about what people think about me? What about bills? What about careers? 
Are we sacrificing our children on the altar so that we can have a better job and get a promotion? What's, what, what are we captive to today? Maybe it's just secular culture. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe it's unbelief. What is it that you're captive to today? Jesus says, I came to proclaim liberty. I came to give you freedom. I came to break the chains. I came to unlock the cuffs that are keeping you bound. He said, I came to open the prison for those that are bound up. I came to set you free today. He said, I came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God. When Jesus died on the cross, he got revenge for the Lord. He got his people back. He got his children back. That's you. Do you understand? That's the gospel. That we were dead. We had nothing. We were empty. But he came and bought us back. The word redeem means to buy back. Jesus is the great redeemer. In Alabama, there's a place in downtown Mobile where they have a monument where the last slave ship came into America. And underneath downtown Mobile are all these tunnels where when they would buy slaves, they would take them through the tunnels and get them out into the plantations. And when you go down there and I look at that monument, I think about the families that were torn apart. I think about the men and women that stood there on an auction block as someone came and examined them to see if they were worth, worth the price that was going to be paid. And then I can't help but think about Jesus. See, I was a slave to sin. I was a slave to Satan. I was a slave to death. And he had me on the auction block. And my business was out there for everybody to see. I was naked. I was vulnerable. I was scared. I was afraid. I had no way out. And the devil was telling me, nobody wants to buy you. You're not worthy of anything. But then came Jesus and he said, I'll take that. I'll pay the price. That's what he's done for you this morning. And the good news is this. You don't have to do nothing but say yes.